This morning I'm beginning this series on the fruit of the Spirit. And you may remember if you were here in 2012 that that year I did a series of messages on the book of Galatians. And we talked about grace and about how God doesn't he doesn't go according to the typical system that we would use where you look at right and you look at wrong and you kind of balance out the two. But grace means that none of us deserve God's love, but he grants it to everyone who asks. In that series, the sixth message from Galatians was about this entire fifth chapter of Galatians. And so in that one message, I dealt with the entire chapter. This morning, we are, taking, we are beginning a journey that will take the exact opposite approach. Over the next nine weeks, we'll be looking at individual fruit of the Spirit. The individual fruits, plural, of the Spirit. Now, I'm going to talk about the, the fruit versus fruit in just a second. So... Uh, I, we'll, we'll get to that. But I want to sh- start by saying we didn't cover the fruit in this way that I want to, which is why we're back again now. And, and I want to emphasize something, and I want to tell a story that I believe I told not too long ago, but it makes a really good point, and it will be helpful in understanding this, this series of messages. Some of you may remember, because I don't know how long ago I told, I used this illustration, but it's about how they control an, a full-grown elephant when they're traveling. A full-grown elephant has the power of a bulldozer. They're about 12,000 pounds, six tons. And they are enormously powerful animals. And the problem is, how do you corral a full-grown elephant when he could basically, you would have to have a, a container multiple feet thick, one foot probably wouldn't do it, of concrete to corral one. And of course, if you've got one elephant, you might be able to do that. But if you have a whole caravan of elephants like they do in some parts of India and Africa, you really would be in trouble. But there's a really simple way that they control the elephants. And here's how they do it. When they're very young, about 200 pounds, they take an elephant, they drive a stake in the ground, they take a small rope, they tie the elephant to the rope, to the rope, to the stake that's in the ground, and for the next 12 hours, that little elephant will try repeatedly to get away. He will pull, he will grunt, he will lay down and take a little rest, and then he will try it all over again. And finally, at the end of about 12 hours, the little elephant realizes there is no way possible for him to pull that stake out of the ground, and he gives up. At that point, the elephant has been conditioned to think that he'll never be able to get away from that rope. And so even though he eventually goes to a full six tons, and he could literally knock this building off of its foundation, he will never even try to pull the rope out of the ground again. Because he has been conditioned to believe this is beyond my ability. And so he never tries. Now, the way that relates to the message that I'm sharing with you this morning is this. A lot of people have come to the conclusion that living a godly life like the one characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, they think that that life is beyond them, that they cannot be people of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the rest. And so they have quit trying. They have come to the conclusion that that kind of life is not possible. But they are wrong. There's an interesting fact that comes out in the fruit of the Spirit which illustrates something really significant. And and I think this is interesting because you frequently hear people talk about the fruits of the Spirit. In fact, if you look here up in the upper corner, it says fruits of the Spirit. But the word in in the Greek of the New Testament is singular. It is not fruits of the Spirit, which would emphasize the different types of fruits. It's a singular word, the fruit of the Spirit, emphasizing that all of it comes not from us, but from the Holy Spirit. So we are challenged 
to allow these things to develop in our lives, but I want you to understand, we are not responsible to develop these on our own. We are responsible to allow the Holy Spirit to develop these in us. It's not all about us. It's all about what He ultimately wants to do. Now, when we read the entire passage in just a moment, you're going to notice that in verse 19, He talks about the desires, plural, desires of the flesh. Those come from us. If we were to let ourselves go and do everything we wanted and would naturally do, you can find a description of what that would look like in verse 19. But if we instead allow the Holy Spirit to change and transform us, that comes from God. We just cooperate. Make sense? If you found Galatians 5, if you would please follow along with me, we'll begin with verse 16 and we will conclude with verse 23. Here's what Paul writes. So I say let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants you to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these. In this conflict, the passage describes here actually mirrors what Paul talks about in Romans 7. He talks about a conflict that goes on inside of us. A conflict between what we know is right and what we want to do. Who in here has been tempted to lie? How many of you have done it? Okay. How many of you want to be loving? How many of you have done that? How many of you have also been tempted to be hateful? And how many of you have done that? There, there is a balance here. There is an inner struggle that goes on inside of all of us between the desires of our humanity and the spiritual fruit that the Holy Spirit wants to produce inside of us. So let's pray and ask God to help us understand how that works in our lives. And then let's begin our study today of love, the very first fruit of the Spirit. God, open our hearts and minds to you today, I pray. Help us to understand the significance of love and how you want to produce that in our lives. God, I pray that as I share that I would be clear, that I would be practical, and God, that all of us would leave here more committed than ever before to be the people of love that you have called us to be. In your name I ask these things. Amen. So, let's begin this first fruit of the Spirit. And I want you to notice where the po Apostle Paul begins. He begins with love, and that's no accident because, here's the first point of the message. Love is the foundation. Why do you think Paul begins his list of the fruit of the Spirit with love? Could it be that love is the most important? I believe it is. And I want to show you why I believe that. In just a moment, we're going to look at Mark chapter 12. And don't worry, I'm going to put it on the screen. Although if you want to look up Mark 12, 28, you, you're welcome to do that. Jesus was asked a very important question. It was a question that really cuts to the chase. Uh, this, a scribe, a a specialist in the law came to Jesus with a good question. Actually, that's not true. It wasn't a good question. It was a great question. It's the kind of question that if we got sat down to talk with Jesus, I think it's the kind of question we might ask. Jesus, what's most important? What's the most important thing? The most important commandment? 
And we find Jesus answering that question here in Mark. Let's, let's read it together. One of the teachers of the religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this, Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is one and only, is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Commandment number one is we are to love God. Commandment number two, verse 31, we are to love our neighbor. We're to love those around us. He says these are the most significant commandments. And his point is really a big one. His point is that the greatest and most important commandment God has given is love. Now that's quite a statement, isn't it? Because think of all the things he doesn't say. He doesn't say the greatest commandment is do not lie. Or what about this one? Do not steal. Now that's a pretty important commandment, isn't it? Anybody here ever had something stolen? <coughs> Isn't it frustrating? Doesn't it make you angry? Or what about this one? Do not be unkind or do not be hateful. But instead of making it a negative, do not do something that is bad, Jesus instead says the greatest commandment is not something not to do. The greatest commandment is something to do. And the thing that you need to do is love. Not just love for God, but also love for your fellow man. Jesus made the most important command, loving him. And the second, which is so similar to the first, loving other people. So, look at your notes. It's no accident that love is the first fruit of the Spirit. But perhaps we need to ask another question. Why this commandment about love? What's so special about love? Well, let me explain why I believe this is the greatest commandment. It's because if we love God as we should, then we will seek to please Him. Let me illustrate. My wife loves me. Not always easy. And lest you think I'm making a joke, is it always easy to love any of you? No, I'm not making a joke. It's true. None of us are always easy to love. But she loves me. And one of the ways she demonstrates that love is she works really hard at cooking us great meals. That's one of the ways she loves us. She does a good job, doesn't she, Nick? Yes. That boy has a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah, mom does a great job of cooking the meals. She demonstrates her love that way. She does things for the family and that is an expression of her love. Now there is no command in scripture that says you are to cook good meals for your family. Is that in there? Okay. I'm the pastor. It's not there. It's not there. But that is an expression of her love. Now, there is a commandment in Scripture that says you are not to commit adultery. Now, let's apply this one to me. That commandment to me, do not commit adultery. If I love my wife as I should, is that commandment required? Okay. Well, listen to me now. Think with me. If I love my wife as I should, will I betray her confidence? Will I cheat on her if I love her as I should? If I love Kelly the way I should love Kelly, I will not cheat on her. And if she loves me as she should, she will not cheat on me. Now, the command is in there because we don't always love as we should. Understand? But when it comes down to the great commandments, and Jesus says, these are the two big ones. If you love God, then you will want to please God. If you love others, then you're going to treat them right. If I truly love you, I will not mistreat you. So here's the principle. Look at the next statement in your notes. Love is foundational. 
Because if we love, we will try to do what's right. Isn't that true? If we really love, we will be committed to doing what's right. Now, back to Galatians. That's the reason God begins with love when He comes to the fruit of the Spirit because love is foundational. Not only here, but in other places as well. Remember 1 Corinthians 13? If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become as a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Somebody uh, years ago, I believe it was my brother Jerry, sent me a, an adaptation of 1 Corinthians 13 with the suggestion that if Paul were writing it today, this might be the way it would read. Listen to this. I think you'll get a kick out of it. But it makes some great points. If I speak with the confidence of Rush Limbaugh, and sing with the ease of Celine Dion, but don't have love, my words are like scraping fingernails on a chalkboard. If I can program NASA's mainframe computer and outsmart my chemistry professor, if I can memorize the Psalms and read Leviticus without dozing, or if I can predict the future but have not love, my value is equal to a pitcher of warm spit. If I give my designer clothes to goodwill and let my little sister rummage through my closet, if I go to the stake and fry as a martyr, or if I donate a gallon of blood every hour but don't have love, my offerings are utterly useless. Love is patient. Even if it means skipping a trip to Baskin Robbins in order to tutor an immigrant child. Love is patient. Love is kind. It means I don't stoop to tell ethnic jokes. It doesn't envy the basketball team captain or the national merit finalist, the class president, or even the blonde who sports the most even tan. Love doesn't get a swelled head over straight A's or a scholarship to Yale. Love isn't snooty about a new car or a season pass to a world premier ski resort. Love never jeers at the fat kid who hangs out of his t-shirt in P.E. Love smiles even when getting cut off on the interstate. Love submits an honest tax return. Love doesn't whine about the referee's bad call. Love believes, and this is really good guys, love believes that God always ultimately provides the best. Love does not change like hem lines and hairdos. Love is like the Energizer Bunny. It just keeps going and going and going. In the end, only three things will remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Do you get the point? Love is foundational. That's the reason it's first in the list of the fruit of the Spirit. It's what we are primarily... If you get this first one right, the other is sort of going to fall into line. But that brings us to the second thing I want to share with you about the fruit of the Spirit called love. And this is it. Love is from God. Now most of you know that the Greeks had several different words which mean with what we use for our word love. Our word can mean a series of different things. In fact, I want to, show, I want to go over it. There's four different words used in the Greek language for love. The first is the word Phileo. Doesn't have anything to do with fillets, like meat. It has, it's phileo. It's the love of friendship. Not the love of friendship, but the love friends share with one another. Now, if you have good friends, you understand this love. There is a camaraderie. There is a connection that we have with our close friends, is there not? You can share what's on your heart. You know you will be accepted and loved, even if... You're not always perfect. Phileo. That's the first kind of love. But there are other types of love as well. There is also, there is also a love that uses in the Greek the word eros. It is the sexual love. In fact, we get our English word erotic from this word. It speaks, of course, of the physical, sexual love. Then there's a word for the love a family has for another. That word is storge. We storge. We love our family members. There is a connection that is somewhat different from phileo. But it's a, it's a connection that we have because we are family. And then there was a word that was introduced new by the Christian faith. 
A fourth kind of love which had never been used as a verb before Scripture came along. It is the word agape or agapos. It is a love that is unselfish and giving and requires nothing in return. It is what Jesus did for us when he went to the cross and died in our place. Now, that's, that's the idea here, and that's what he's talking about. So, look at the next statement in your notes. The Greek language has three different words for love, but God introduced a new word for love, the word agape, A-G-A-P-E, which speaks of a sacrificial, unselfish love. Now, many have described this simply as godly love. It's the kind of love we just talked about that Jesus demonstrated when he went to the cross. In fact, that's the word used in John 3, 16. For God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son. The love that's spoken of as a fruit of the Spirit is based on one of these words as well. Do you think it's phileo or storge or eros? No. It's that fourth word, agape. What he, the fruit of the Spirit is that we develop within us a sacrificial, unselfish kind of giving love. In fact, I want to look at a passage from 1 John 4 that goes over the background of the word. In fact, look at it and read it with me on the screen. This is what the Apostle John writes in his letter. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God for... Read that next phrase with me out loud. God is love. God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. Anybody want to guess which word is used here? It's agape again. Paul says, we are to love one another because love comes from where? Love is from God. It comes from Him, and we as God's children are supposed to be people of love. In fact, He doesn't just tell us to love. He makes the point that God Himself is love. The passage continues and makes the point even stronger when it says in verse 9 that God shows us how He has loved us by sending Jesus to die for us. He has demonstrated what love is. You know, it's really good when you tell a child to do something, but it has a lot more impact when you show them how to do it. This is what God is doing in this passage. He is saying, love is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. But then when we look at the rest of Scripture, like this passage, he says, I will show you what love looks like. Love looks like you sacrificing yourself for someone else. Now we can just skip right off of that because that is such an easy thing to do, isn't it? Good. You're disagreeing with me. No, it is not easy. How many of you are selfish? You know, I never remember my parents sitting down with me and saying, Tim, I want to teach you how to be selfish. Think primarily of yourself. Do what you want, no matter what we say or what other people say. Don't respect your elders. You know, you lie when you want. You do what you want. You get up when you want. You go to bed when you want. The w world is all about you, Tim. I think I slept through that lesson. Because it didn't happen. But, you know what? Many times throughout my life I have discovered I have selfish nature. I tend to think, okay, this is confession time. You know who I think about more than you? Me. Okay, now, let's be honest. Who do you think most about? How many of you spend most of your time thinking about how to please me? <laughs> Nick, I love you, but not even a chance. There's only one person here who thinks more about pleasing me 
than almost anything else. Isn't the same true for you? Isn't it just natural? But that is the exact opposite of agape. That's the desires of the flesh. The get what Tim wants when Tim wants it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love for Him and for you. That's agape. That's what this love is all about. That's what he's talking about in the passage. So, look at the next statement in your notes. Here's the point. God is love, and he wants us to love one another. When Paul says that love, the first fruit of the Spirit, he certainly uses that word agape, and it shouldn't surprise us, for this love cannot be produced by us. It has to be produced supernaturally. The kind of love God wants to produce in our lives is the highest kind of love. And that brings us to the final point. Third point in the message. Love is action, not emotion. Sometimes we Christians are good at talking about love. How many of you kind of perked up when you heard I was talking about love this morning? Don't we like a good sermon on love? Okay, if I had announced, this morning I'll be speaking about pornography. How many of you would have gone, ooh... I was joking with someone last week, a friend said in the week leading up to Easter, what are you preaching about Easter Sunday? And I jokingly said, oh, I think I'll do pornography. And the person said, hmm. Because they knew what I was preaching about on Easter Sunday. Every other preacher in the country preached about Easter. Unless they were an idiot. Because I mean, you know, that's like, what do you preach on the, day, the Sunday before Christmas? Oh, let's see. I think we'll deal with tithing that week. No, no. You, that, that, that topic is set. You know what I'm going to be talking about the week before Christmas, don't you? You may not know which exact passage, but I'm going to be talking about the birth of Christ. And you know what I'm going to... But here's the point. He's wanting us to understand... He's wanting us to understand that love is action. Look at what Jesus said in John 13, 34, and 35. Here it is on the screen. Jesus says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now, did Jesus mean, I want you to have gushy feelings toward the other disciples. I want you to have ooey-gooey feelings in your heart toward God. Is that what he is saying? No, that's not the point. He is saying, you know, if, if I love my wife, then that love means I will sacrifice and do some things for her that I may not want to do. If I love my children, then I will do things for them that may not come naturally. Just an example. I went to bed last night before Ashley was home. I woke up at 5 o'clock this morning. I looked out the window to make sure her car was there. It was dim and I didn't have my glasses on and I couldn't see it. So you know what I did? I got up. She didn't know this. I went downstairs. I didn't bring my glasses. I looked out the front door. She wasn't parked where she normally parks. So I went back upstairs. I thought, oh, well, I'll look in her room. So I opened her door, and it was dark, and I didn't want to turn on the light because I assumed she was probably there, but I couldn't see her. I didn't really want to wander across the room and fall in the middle of the floor and wake her up and scare her to death. So I went and turned the, the light on in the bathroom, left the door open, and came back, and finally I realized her fan had been moved from where it was the night before, and I knew she was home, and then I went back to bed. Now, question. Do you really think I felt like getting up at 5 o'clock and looking outside to see if she was there? I assumed she was. But I had to look. Understand? That's a small, 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 small example of what love is. It means you do what doesn't come naturally. You do what you do because you care. 
That's what Paul is talking about. That's what God is talking about. He says, in fact, your love, verse 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. In other words, please hear what I'm getting ready to say. If we are a church that does not demonstrate love, we are not true disciples of Jesus Christ. That's pretty harsh, is it not? But isn't that precisely what he says in verse 35? Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Why does it prove to the world that he is, we are his disciples? Because he is love. He is love. And because he commanded us to love each other just as he has loved us. That's love. That's what we're talking about. That's what he's talking about. Look at the next statement in your notes. According to Jesus, if others can't see our love, they won't know we're his disciples. That means love must affect the way we treat one another. It has to. The way we treat one another should make an impression. When people walk into this place, they should tell, they should be able to tell that we are a church family that loves each other. And I think they can. This is a loving place. Now, is it a perfect place? No. But it's a loving place. Let's move from the Gospel of John to the letter of 1 John again. In the Gospel of John, Jesus was talking about love, and he was saying it's a new commandment. But in the letter of 1 John, chapter 4, this is a later part of 1 John, chapter 4, than we looked at earlier, he makes nearly the same point, but he makes it even more emphatically. Look at 1 John 4, 20 and 21. Here's what he says. If someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. For if we cannot love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their Christian brothers and sisters. Now look how dramatically God makes this point through the Apostle John. He says, if you say, oh, I love God. I can't stand Bob and Debbie. I'm sorry. You're just getting on my nerves today. But I, I really love God. I just can't stand them. According to the verse that's on the screen, what does that prove? Yeah, who said it? Liar. Yeah, that's exactly. That's not Tim Richards' point. Isn't that the very point God's making? If I love God, but I can't stand you, what say about me? I'm not being honest. I may not even be honest with myself, but God says, you know, if you can't love people that you can see, how dare you claim you can in, that you can love God who He's invisible? How many of you have ever actually seen God? I mean the presence of God. I haven't. But that's the greatest commandment. But he says, listen, if you can't love people who you can see, then how can you claim to love God who's invisible? That's what love is all about. So final, final statement in your notes. Love must be demonstrated or it doesn't count. So when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, it's not an accident that this is where Paul begins. This is where God begins. The fruit of the Spirit, the very first one is love. We need to be willing to demonstrate that love. Our focus needs to change. Let me tell you a story that an author by the name of uh, Dale Galloway, I believe, yes. Dale Galloway told in a book called Dream a New Dream. It's a great story about a little boy in kindergarten named Chad. Happened many years ago. Little Chad was a very, very shy little boy. In fact, he almost never talked to anybody, including his classmates. He was so shy and withdrawn that his mother worried about him every single day. Every morning she would send him out the door and it was a very short walk to school and she would watch as little Chad walked down the sidewalk with the other children from his kindergarten class and he never spoke to them and they never spoke to him. He was such a quiet little boy until he got home. Chad announced one January, Mom, I want to make Valentine's cards for all my friends in my class. And the mother said, my heart sunk because none of the other children ever talked to Chad. 
And she thought, oh no, my son is going to get hurt. He is going to make all these cards and he may not get very many or possibly even any in return. Now, Chad didn't want to go down to the local Walmart and buy a box of cards. Over the next three weeks, every single night, Chad worked on making handmade cards for every child in his class. Colored every one by hand. It was an act of love. On the morning of Valentine's Day, the mother packed them all very carefully into the Valentine box that Chad was carrying to school with him. And he walked out the door for the short trip to school. And she watched and no children talked to Chad and no Chad didn't talk to any children. And he got to school and the mother thought, oh no, he's going to come home heartbroken today. She was watching. She decided she would make chocolate chip cookies, Chad's favorite, and would have fresh, hot chocolate chip cookies when Chad walked through the door with a glass of cold milk sitting on the table. And she watched, and sure enough, at the appropriate time, Chad and the little friends came walking down the street. Chad, again, was all by himself. Deep in concentration, Chad was as he walked down the street and he walked in the house and as he walked through the door the mother heard him say these words not a one not a single one and the mother began to began to cry and she thought oh no after all that work Chad didn't get a single Valentine's card from another student and then little Chad turned to his mom and said mom I didn't forget a one not a single one. I made a card for every kid in my entire class. I didn't forget any of them. The love that God calls us to have is a kind of love that focuses on what we can give, not on what we can get. Love that means I get something from you is really not love. That's nature. Love that figures out how I can give to you, that's love. Now, let me put a little disclaimer on that. Does that mean that we give every person exactly what they want every time? No. But it means that my desire in what I do for you is for your best interest. Love sometimes is tough, is it not? Sometimes we don't give our children everything they want, not because we don't love them, but because to give them everything they want would not be good for them. And sometimes God says no to us because the things that we think we want, I think God looks down and says, you're kidding, right? You really think that's what's best for you? No, that's just what I want. Understand? Love is about what we can give that will help a person, not what we can give that will make our life easier. Let's pray. God, thank you for your incredible love for us that you demonstrated by coming to this earth and dying for us. God, I pray that you would help us to be people who have the fruit of your spirit radiating from us this fruit of love. That we would care. That we would show your love to other people unselfishly, sacrificially. God, help us as your people to be, to make this kind of love evident in our lives. In your name we pray.